So um, I'm here to talk about the magic of customer service, which is a pretty tall order when it comes down to it. Um, I do, so the, the type of work that I do is really quite varied, um, but I tend to tie it to something called techne, and basically it's how we do what we do, when we do what we do. And my promise on this is I can make anything better. And I mean that quite literally, um, and I'll explain why. It's got nothing to do with me and everything to do with the work, uh, but that's what I want to take you through, okay? Oosh. Um, so I tend to like to start with um, gratitude anytime I get to speak, and I love this city. I love living here. Um, I moved 15 times before I got out of high school, and I've lived all across this country, and for whatever reason, when I came to this city, I felt home for the first time ever. I've tried on a number of different occasions to come up with why it is, I don't know. There's just something that I love about this place and I love the fact that you're here doing the work that you do so I get to enjoy this, this magical and beautiful city. Um, I also love Edmonton. I'm thinking about Edmonton today. Um, my friend Owen is here. Owen and I work together and Owen's an Edmontonian and so today I'm doing this speech with you and then we're hopping, it's a perfect day for it, hopping on the highway to go to Edmonton to do a different speech um, for folks up in Edmonton that are trying to work on their city. I love this too because it's, you know, it's that, that kind of rivalry, um, which is, is fun, right? We have a rivalry internally, but we're siblings, so you can't make fun of us from outside of the province. Also, if you're going to make fun of us, I wouldn't be using a sign with a font like that, but anyways. Okay, um, I'm going to give you a warning. I, so this is the first time I've used this warning, actually. I used to give a warning uh, about the phrase avuncular. Uh, and the phrase avuncular, what it means, it comes from the same root as the word uncle. Um, and this is, if you've got anybody in your life that's like this, this is kind of a, an old, you know, an old family member or something that's always giving you advice and it's really condescending. Um, so it's like advice except it feels terrible, it makes you feel awful. Um, that's what being avuncular is. And so the trick with the way that I do my work is I'm super obsessive about what I do. And so I can get sounding really certain about it. And here's what you should do and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I didn't even come to sort of fix this on my own. It was a friend of mine that was at one of my speeches and said, dude, you should give a warning about being avuncular. Um, I'm not here to say like, this is how I live my life. My certainty comes from the fact that this is a lifetime's worth of work in this area on how you can make improvements in different areas. So if I start sounding like I know everything about all this, it's from the study piece. Uh, and why I've switched this to this guy, some of you will know who this is. This is a guy named Joe Rogan who has a podcast. Uh, it's one of the most popular podcasts around. Um, it's become of interest to me because he's had a lot of leading academics on there and he'll have these like three hour conversations on like complex geometry and stuff. It's wild. Anyways, uh, during a couple of these podcasts, he said, uh, I hate these people that come into where you work and tell you about all this stuff you should do with your work because like who the heck are they and what have they achieved? Uh, and so I thought, well, maybe I should sort of give you that warning because um, the stuff that I study and the stuff that I bring to you, I guarantee you it will work and it is based on research, but I absolutely do not execute it as well as I would like in my own life, right? Like I try, I really work hard at it and things like that, but when we're talking about like refinements and how to be more effective at work and all these types of things, these things are hard, right? Uh, so I don't, I, I started to worry about that because like uh, Rogan was saying, you know, you don't have any credibility unless you're sort of totally perfect in all of those ways. But weirdly, the thing that drives me so much on these things is because I'm so terrible at living life and I would like to get a little bit better. Um, so anyways, there's my warning. Uh, so why in the hell am I here? Because um, I don't really like leaving the, my office or going out into public at all, but I agree to do speeches like this. And I've never said no to doing a speech for the city. Um, and I've used this phrase before, I'm correct on it, you're not gonna believe me, but you'll be wrong and I'll be right, which is that you're heroes. We need you, we need the work that you're doing. We are in a time of extraordinary transformation. That transformation, I don't mean just our city, of global transformation. The change ushered in by that transformation will speed up. The frantic nature of our world will continue for the rest of our lives and we will only have small pockets of stability to get us through that. And so we really need you. And so I say no to most requests to speeches. I always say yes when it's for folks like you.
because we need you doing your job and I know that your job isn't easy. So I'm gonna talk about some things that hopefully will help because I really want to help you because I'm grateful to you for doing this for our city and because I really worry about you because at times of extraordinary stress, the people that are holding things together are the ones that are carrying all of that weight. Okay, so let's deal with some definitions because I've promised you magic and all of that stuff. So um, when we think of magic, right, we think of this type of stuff. It's like, oh, you're gonna do magic in customer service. And that sort of works, right? Because if you think of what magic is, it doesn't really exist, right? It's not real. But what happens is if behind the scenes you work tirelessly forever, then your customer feels like, oh, look, it's magic, right? So it's like, oh, look, it's magic. The roads work and water works and I get this. And it's like, look at that, the city just works. And really the only time you ever hear anything is if there's one tiny little mistake and then you're gonna get attacked. So magic is kind of this high level type of craft piece, but that seems pretty bold to promise. Customers, I think we wanna think about as global whether you're working here or in a global corporation, our customer base is global because we're in global communication and because we, have, we work with people from around the world. So that changes everything. It means that the way that we interact is interacting across different cultural sets, different ways of interacting, different languages. It's much more complicated than it's ever been before. So if you're working with a group that's quite homogenous, right? So say you're on some island somewhere and everyone's from the same background, it is way easier to connect and way easier to have a relationship where you're being understood. Once you get into global, which is lovely, it's you know, bringing the global family together, but it will be by definition extraordinarily difficult. But behind that, there's also the global commentary that we're also all part of. Everyone is now part of a global commentary on how everyone does their work. And if you do some sort of bad thing at work, you could become a global sensation for that, right? It's unlikely that any video will go viral because you've all just done a great smooth job. I'm seeing someone take a picture and I'm noticing that I'm sweating, so I'm gonna do this with my head. I'm a bald guy, so if I sweat, I look like a disco ball on a stick. So <laughs> you can go viral for a mistake. No one's ever gonna make you go viral for, hey, great smooth month of work, right? And there's a background tension behind that. Okay, service, here's why you're heroes. Okay, so because I study techne, because I study everything, I'm interested in studying everything. The way to do that uh, with limited time is to focus on key pieces of information. So I like old stories. I like old knowledge that tracks down through the ages. The beginnings of the conversation about how civilization should work, how we should build society, how we should do politics, how we should develop health, how we should do government, and how we should deal with education came out of a conversation around two things, neoti seotun and neoti eotu. So the self-knowledge is the first part. You should learn, right? Read books, uh, listen to people talk, have experiences. The second part is what's seen as the most important part. It's care of the self. And what that means is it's caring for yourself in such a way that you are able to best care for the world. So you can, serve more, well, sorry, you can serve more people if you're caring for yourself. And the highest component of that inside of the ancient civilizations, right, when they're founding all this stuff in ancient Greece, when they were looking at it in the ancient, in the Ottoman Empire, et cetera, was public service. Working for the city was seen as the highest calling one could have. Because by definition, you are serving all of the people around you, right? So in the whole history of the way that we approach ideas, education, government, everything, what you do is seen as the highest calling. Now, I'm going to just go out on a limb and say that you don't really hear that a lot out in the world. In your customer experience relations, that's probably not manifesting. Well, here's the other part of being a hero. You don't get a lot of gratitude you tend to have to save the world over and over again and get really no thanks for it. Okay, so let's move into the real world if we're gonna deal with this stuff. So one of the things that has freaked me out about the world, and many, many things freak me out about the world, 
are the emergence of these signs over the last kind of five to ten years. This one's from the BC uh, Public Service. Um, but like the, a sign in a place that says, don't abuse us. Like, who the hell has to be reminded of something like that? What has happened to us when you need a sign? To, oh, it's like, whoops, oh, sorry. I should not have been abusing you. And what I love about this sign is, you can swear and shout and then punch me in the face, and that may lead to a denial of, like, what the heck is going on there? If I've still got, like, if I've only got one black eye, I'm still going to work with you? It's like, so this gives us an indication of what's going on in personal relations. Right? The fact that we have to post a sign to say, don't abuse us, like that's a basic, that should be easier than reminding someone to breathe air, as far as I'm concerned. But it gives us an indication of some of the challenges we're experiencing. Okay, here's why. It's because maybe customers aren't all that terrific. Maybe we get customers that can be a bit of a challenge. Right? You don't, if you've got to serve everybody, you're maybe not going to get everybody on their best day. Maybe your customers are your internal people, and you're working with people who, and I'm sure none of them work with you, but I work with people who seem to specialize in talking all the time about how hard they work and how hard done by they are, yet never seem to do any actual work. <laughs> then you get the, oh, those abuse people. Right? People that seem to be so worked up and out of their heads that they're getting like threatening in a work environment. Right? You're clearly way too ramped up when you're into that place. Now look, we know that there's much more of this kind of emotional behavior in the world and there are direct reasons for it. So I want to try and address that so you can use some techniques to help make it work for your world. So, if you think of like what kind of magic do you need for customer service, like I know I'm supposed to come in here and say like customer service is great and we're doing wonderful things. No, it's not. Customer service sucks. It's essential, but it sucks because it's really draining. Like even on the best day, it's exhausting work. Everyone is there and it's their most important interaction of the day. You've got to deal with a whole raft of it and you never know what somebody is bringing there. You have to be on your best behavior. No one else does, which is why we've got this sign saying, if you could please just not punch this person, we'd appreciate it, right? Like, it's clearly saying that something is going on there, right? So this is not the kind of magic we need. You're not, gonna, you're not dealing with that kind of an audience. This is the kind of magic that you need. It's kind of a weird twist over too, because I kind of look like Voldemort. <laughs> what you need when you're thinking tactics is how to use magic that will allow you to do a good job and not get poisoned by any magic that's coming from the other direction. And there's some skills. All right. I tend to try to bring things that are actual things that you would do. So the idea with this would be, I'm gonna share these, and then you're gonna try them, and if they work, things will get a little better. And if they don't work, you can say, that guy was an idiot, never bring him back, right? but you're not gonna know unless you try them. Okay, techne. So we wanna be aware of techne because this is where you wanna sort of get a hold of how your work life is gonna define everything else that you're doing. This phrase, I bring it up all the time, I say that it's the most important phrase ever uttered, and it, oh, sorry, it's not the Yoda phrase, it's this phrase. You are what you repeatedly do, right? So we hear a lot about this in kind of behavioral stuff and in training and these types of things. So if what happened is you all wanted to, you're going to, you know, get a hockey team together. So you start skating every day. So you get better at skating, right? Because you are what you repeatedly do. Now, some folks are going to get like way better at skating. Some folks are going to get, you know, pretty good. And some folks will only get a little bit better. But you're all going to get better because you are what you repeatedly do, right? Cool. We know this. This is how you learn. This is how you develop muscle. This is how you develop new thoughts. This is how you develop emotional connection. We know this very well. The part that we miss is the other side of this, which is that anything you do, you strengthen. So if you're at work and you're allowing yourself to be mistreated, you're developing a practice of accepting less for yourself. You're developing a practice that is like, deep 
muscular, strong muscles of accepting mistreatment. So it's not about getting someday to a point where you say, I will never let this happen again, and then you're starting from zero. You say, I will never let this happen again, and you are starting from a deficit. You gotta work all those muscles back out just to get back to zero. This is why you wanna be very careful about how you spend your day. What you do over and over again defines who you are. So how you behave at work, impacts how you are at home, guaranteed, right? One of the areas that they first started talking about this on was the, the idea of retirement death, right? So you work your whole life, working super hard, never taking any vacation or anything like that, and it's like, oh, and then when I retire, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna golf in Arizona. So you get done work, you go to Arizona, and you're trying to golf and stuff like that, but you don't have any practice. You didn't develop it. You don't know how to golf in Arizona. All you have is a lifetime of, I will suffer living a life I don't want to live and do what I'm told for this thing eventually in the future, which means you're not prepared. You haven't developed how to enjoy your life. And it's a trap, right? And it's why we've seen with people, you'll get these people that will retire and shortly thereafter, they end up passing away. And it's this like, weird statistical anomaly until you realize what you needed to do was golf every once in a while to reduce stress and enjoy your life and develop a retirement practice. Does that make sense? It's really the most powerful thing you can think of. It connects to and why I put this um, do. You don't want to work at, say, reduced capacity. right? Ah, I don't care today, so I'm just going to phone it in. You're not missing 25% of productivity. You're developing a mediocrity practice. Every hour you put into a mediocrity practice, you become a master of mediocrity. Here's another way of saying it. A few years ago, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book where he talked about the 10,000 hour rule. Do something for 10,000 hours, you can become a master. Let's go back to that golf analogy. There's a lot of people that golf for 10,000 hours and they suck. <laughs> they are masters of mediocrity. So you got to get ruthless about taking control of your time if you're being placed in conditions that cause you to develop a muscular practice of something you don't want to live. Right? Cool. Celebrate your deliberate strangeness. So we all live, if you haven't seen this movie, it's tremendous, by the way, if any of you have kids in particular. Um, it's called Strange Magic. It's a musical. Um, anyways, what we used to do inside of education and inside of work was try to get everybody to follow a few key behavioral patterns. So you show up at university, if you're a bit weird, we kind of groom it out of you. You go to college, we groom it out of you. We get everybody to kind of behave in a similar fashion because repeatable behavior works well within an industrial world. Now we live in a networked world and so what we need is weirdness. Each person has a kind of a unique voice and we need that uniqueness. We gotta be very careful that we don't coerce each other into becoming drones. If you want highly collaborative work, if you want really great work, don't worry about changing people. Worry about saying, here's how I'm weird, here's how you're weird, how do we work together? Focus on the project. Because otherwise, if you just keep go going into the sort of programmatic stuff of everybody's got to think the same way, work the same way, et cetera, all you will guarantee is that you will have work, like workload reduction, productivity reduction, creativity reduction, and happiness reduction. Let people be who they are. Focus on the goal. And same goes for you, by the way. Generally, right, we always do when we do like talent coaching in that, the weird thing about you that you like hide is actually your superpower. It's gonna be the source of where your most kind of creative or unique contribution is. Okay, so this is a platitude, but with a, a sort of a new addition to it. If you're working in customer service, you must have had somebody say this kind of a thing to you, right? Everybody is going through something. I mean, we, we all tell ourselves that when we're out in traffic and somebody cuts us off and you're trying to remind yourself not to yell and scream, you say, well, everybody's going through something. What we know is that right now, globally, 
Um, civically, nationally, provincially, we are in a loneliness epidemic, right? Um, we've basically signed over social interaction to a bunch of people with no social skills whatsoever, called it social media, and now everyone is entirely disconnected. So people are going through extraordinary challenges in their lives without much of a way to work it out. So that means that if you're dealing with customer stuff, you're probably going to begin seeing behaviors that are more ramped up. So now you're thinking like, oh, I've got to get them these permits, or I've got to work on this project, or I've got to deal with this complaint. Yes, that's about 50% of it. The other 50% is you are now their priest or psychiatrist or whatever, because they're going to unload on you because no one else will listen to them. Everybody's going through something and people are completely isolated now. So we're seeing people blow up in public a lot because it's got to come out somewhere. And unfortunately, folks that are in sort of stability work, so the city, right? They're going to blame you. They're going to blame people who can't hit back. It's always been the way, really. The caretakers, the heroes, the people doing things, are the ones that take all of the heat. Under all of that, by the way, we do, we attack the ones we love. We're tough on the ones we love. But when you're dealing with people in today's environment, you're going to be dealing with increased emotional engagement for some very specific reasons. Okay, here's one quick way. So you're in a, an interaction, whether it's a one-off or a long-term, and it makes no sense, right? Because it's easy for us to talk about like, oh, the person was angry or the thing was late. But I'm guessing all of you have had many, many, many occasions when you're dealing with someone and it's like, this doesn't even make sense. Like, this is completely irrational. This person is totally worked up and not making any sense at all. That's when you're in emotion land, right? You've no longer got the executive function of the brain on. This person is working from emotion. All of us can get there, right? Again, you get cut off in traffic. Fight or flight kicks in. You are not thinking anymore. You're reacting. So if a person's in that place, they're not going to make sense. So how do you deal with that when you're face to face with someone who is basically a wild animal, right? Whether they're attacking you or not, they are not predictable. They are not coherent. You're going to be like, but that doesn't make sense, or but you just have to fill out the form, but you didn't go to the back of the line. You're trying to use logic on someone who doesn't have that part of their brain on. Get curious. So what we know is for you to keep your calm in one of those intense engagements, you want to look for detail and try and play a little game. It's like, wow, really interesting how that person's eyes are beet red. Look at how like they're spitting all over the place. Wow, they're really shaking. I mean this quite literally. What you're doing is you're looking for detail to be in the situation. It keeps your mind focused. So what we know is that when we hang out with people, our brains and our emotional states begin to sync up. So you know like you're in a room and everything's like fine and then somebody who's a total downer comes in and it's like, ugh, right? Yeah, well crazy does the same thing. So if you're there and you're dealing with somebody who's really jacked up, you need to stay calm so you can get the two of you out of it. And let's be very clear, by the way, we all can be on the other side of that matrix, yes? It's not that we're saying that some people are like this. We all can go into these types of places, right? And so we do this for one another. But for you who's having to do it repeatedly, get interested in detail. It keeps your mind calm when face to face with such unpredictable threat. And believe me, like the stress levels on that stuff is not good for you over time. So get curious, make a game. Say, oh, this is the loudest I've ever been yelled at. I, I, I had one of these once where I had a, a person who's a good friend, but was going through kind of a tough time. And we were working on a project and she just started yelling at me. And so I, like, I looked at, my t at the time, she yelled for over half an hour straight. And so like, at first it was kind of scary, but like past five minutes, I'm going like, this is extraordinary. And like, then I'm kind of like rooting for like, how long can this go, right? And you're like 10, 15, 20 minutes. It's like, when is she gonna run out of air? It was amazing, right? But what I'm doing is I have to be in this situation. It was a serious situation. The person is a friend, but they were in a certain type of a place. You just gotta ride it out, right? And things got better afterwards, but just be aware. We can be caught inside of these things. And instead of having to like, 
abandon it. Just look for detail. It's what keeps your mind focused. When we use detail like this, it's because when we get kind of triggered or get knocked out of focus, you want to do something to get you back in. Same thing can happen, like, so if somebody uh, is, like, threatening you or upsetting you or insulting you, do a math problem because it gets the front end of your mind going again because if what I do is I bully you or whatever, your executive function goes off. And so, like, an hour and a half later, you think of the thing you should have said to me, and you're like, why didn't I think of it then? And it's because what I did was turn your thinking brain off, right? You're working in reaction brain. That's the second time I've done that. Good heavens. You're working in reaction brain. Look for detail. Create a character. Okay? I've got a, a lot of friends that do this, um, and it's, you're going to think it sounds silly, but it's used by a lot of people, and it's super successful. So here's the deal. Let's imagine that you have lives outside of your job. <laughs> How often are the people in those lives, and let's assume that there are people in those lives, how often are the people in those lives saying, hey, I wish you could bring a lot more of the negative stuff from work home with you? <laughs> this is why I say this notion of being kind of poisoned by that kind of stuff at work, right? You want to find ways to have work be work and then walk away. So what we know is that people that are in high-stress jobs, public engagement jobs, very often create a character. Now, I've given you some celebrity examples of people who created a character, and by being in that character, could live one way and then stop and go home. But I know all kinds of people that do this in terms of work. And so I've got a good friend. She has this thing that she calls Alpha. I shouldn't give her name, so I'll use a different name. Uh, Alpha Lucy. And the deal is she's quite a quiet, calm, uh, contemplative type of a person, but she works in a high-pressure environment, so she switches into a character for that job. And by doing that, by thinking, I'm this kind of a character, you have your job, and then you leave it behind. Right? So if you need to be an alpha in an environment, you're playing a kind of a superhero role, less stuff gets into your heart to cause you suffering. Now, if you're a bit aggressive, you might want to come up with a bit of a kind of a, a downgrade of that energy, but you can come up with a persona that is your work persona. This may sound sort of somewhat strange, but a lot of people, they kind of bring their whole heart to work wide open. And if that's what you're doing, and it's causing you suffering, and you're taking that home, I would like to suggest that you might want to think about coming up with a different way to present yourself at work. It lets you do your job, right? Like you're not coming up with a crazy, you're not kind of come up with like an evil genius character. You're coming up with like, what is the character that would be most effective for this job? People will talk about this when they get a major job transformation. You do a role change. Don't run around telling people that, you know, you're playing this new character or whatever, but do the new character. And I've done this with lots of groups where what it is is you pick a superhero. Right? What would Superman do in this case? What would these types of things? To give yourself a switch so that if you're dealing with 15 people in a row who are jacked way up, you're dealing with it from this other space, and then you can switch back to who you are when you go home. Make sense? Okay. Creative process. I don't know if you've seen this. This is a live performance of a song that was done. It was a number one hit song. It was from the movies uh, Fast and the Furious. So the, one of the guys that was in that, it's a franchise that's been around for a long time. One of the guys that was in that and helped build it uh, ended up passing away during the filming of one of the, uh, one of the films. And so they wanted to say goodbye. They didn't know how to do it. They're, they, was, they were heartbroken, et cetera. So they wrote this song to basically say goodbye. Um, and it was these two, two guys that did the song and then they performed it live, and it's just beautiful. They did it at the, it was at the American Music Awards, or maybe Billboard Music Awards, I forget which. You can see all the musicians, they're all crying. Um, and these two just did this great job of expressing the pain. So here's this other piece. We hear a lot about creativity and how it's a good thing. Sort of. I mean, it is if it doesn't suck, right? I like to go back to that same 10,000 hour rule. If you're gonna do creativity, but you suck at it, don't, stop. <laughs> but 
the superpower that artists have is that they take in pain and release beauty. So if you decide that that's the way you're going to approach this stuff, when you've got people coming to the desk, when you've got people at work, and they're coming at you with nothing but pain, are you the type of person that can breathe that in and breathe out beauty? Artists can do that. Uh, people that talked about the, the bodhisattvas, there's these, these sort of compassion meditation types of folks that do this. I wouldn't recommend it if you haven't got a practice on this. Breathing in poison to attempt to convert it to beauty might actually just cause you to drop dead on the spot. Um, and that would look bad on me after giving you this advice. But seriously, when we think about what we do when we encounter true pain in the world, we tend to have practices that involve maybe music or poetry or prayer or ritual. Consider if what you are doing is working with people that are experiencing a great deal of suffering, that you might want to give some thought to how you can process that pain and turn it into beauty. Instead of pretending that everything is fine, instead of pretending that everything is positive, instead of putting on a fake happy face, because the song these folks wrote is, was the number one song of the year. It was beautiful. Develop a practice of learning how to use pain to fuel good as opposed to leaving it locked inside of you until you can get it home to your family. Yes? Mirroring. So this is the number one, right? You've probably heard about this. Even when you know it, if someone does it to you, it will work. Mirroring. What you're going to do is, so I come in and I'm like, ah, yell, 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 everything's terrible. I can't believe it snowed. Why aren't the roads clearer than this? I'm, I was late. It's my fault, but I'm mad at you. <laughs> you hear what I say, then capture some of the words in what I said and repeat them back to me. Okay? Now, if I say curse words or things like that, you're not going to repeat those parts. But if you repeat back to me, so it's like, so let me get this straight. I just want to make sure I've heard you. Um, you're angry that the snow has fallen um, and that you were late for being here at this event uh, and you uh, want an apology? And then I will say yes. Okay. <laughs> Here's what's going on. I, I've got to imagine that there's not a person in this room that hasn't noticed that our world is a lot more ramped up these days and that a lot of us, if not all of us, seem to be having moments where we're kind of going off. Like, people are having intense conversations that seem not to be based in a lot of thinking or heartful feeling, right? We're all worked up. Mirroring drops physical stress by almost 50%. So if I'm freaking out and you mirror me, my physical, like my heart rate and blood pressure will drop. So what's happening with mirroring is we are communicative beings. We learn through mimesis, right? This is why they say, like, you know, if you have a kid and you're raising the kid, it's like, don't be, you know, smoking and shooting meth in front of the kid, because then the kid will learn how to smoke and shoot meth. I don't think you shoot meth. My dad never taught me that. <laughs> <laughs> because we learn by seeing. We, our whole body picks up the information. We are currently in a time period in which very few of us do much face-to-face -face work. We get jacked up with information without connection. With mirroring, what you do is, you're sending me the message, you are heard. So physically, you will drop the intensity of the moment by 50%. After that, what will happen is, this person will feel, I'm being heard. Now, they're not in their head going, I'm being heard. But that's what the feeling is. Try this out and watch how many times you're going to see someone totally change what they're doing and apologize to you. You're going to bring them out of the state they were in. So mirroring is a technique that is used by psychologists and psychiatrists and fight doctors when you're trying to get your fighter to calm back down in between rounds. Mirroring. It's also used in these things we used to have in the old days called relationships. You would talk to one another and make sure that you were hearing one another. But in customer service engagements, people are struggling out there. They're coming to you, and they're unloading. And is that fair? No. But it ain't going to change, because they're struggling. 
and you've given your lives to helping the city, which is noble and is heroic. And if you can mirror them, you can pull them out of a behavior that isn't really who they are. They've got no one to listen to them. They're scared. Like, everyone is scared. Have you seen the news? Good heavens, right? So we're all blowing up at each other, and we're all wanting to connect, and we're all wanting to be heard. And it's people that are on the front lines that are the ones that are going to be able to do this type of stuff. And if you remember it, you can do it for each other, right? Now, mirroring, if it's within a relationship in an internal office type of a thing, it can just be actually hearing people. Because some people are more verbal than others. But it's taken that time. So if you're dealing with somebody, right, on a repeated basis, a good way to do this is say, oh, I just want to get this down and take some notes. It allows you to slow stuff down, right, and gives you something to do while they yell at you for half an hour about how everything is your fault. And then you just say, okay, I just want to make sure I got this straight. And then you repeat it back to them. And then you watch the impact it'll have. It'll transform them. You'll pull them back out and you'll see the real person there. Okay? So, summary. We need you. We are going through the largest change in global structures in human history. It will speed up. We are all seeing how frantic the world is. It will continue to speed up. We're only at the beginning of this. What will hold are the small structural commitments we have in our, in our community. It's you folks doing your job. That's why I'm here. It's why I'm trying to bring you these techniques from the research so you can keep doing your job. Because the last thing we want is for you to have to quit, right? Somebody that's just running an investment segment of something or building some widget, they take the day off, we're good. You folks don't work, the city shuts down. So you need to work on taking care of yourself when you know that the tension is rising everywhere. We used to be able to get through on, I'm just going to tough it through. That is not tough anymore. That was the old world. Tough now is getting right into the arena with these people, using some techniques to make sure that you can bring them out of the place that they're in, the frantic spot that they're in, but also making sure that you take care of yourself so that that crap is not going home to you and your family. Because the abuse part, the person may be good, the abuse part is fundamentally unacceptable, and it sure as heck shouldn't be going home to your house. Yeah? So your job is hard. It's going to get harder. But that's rewarding, particularly if it works. So I brought you seven things. Remember that you are what you do. So try some of these things. Try developing a new piece. Try a thing. Don't do sitting here listening to the bald man who sweats a lot, and then don't do anything about it. Like, the only bigger addiction we have than to sort of pain medications is listening to people tell us how to do things and then not acting on it at all. Right? Oh, yeah, I listened to a thing. I read a meme on Instagram. I'm good to go. Do a thing. Remember that whatever you do, when we are in this time of great change, you're going to have nonstop jerks like me coming in to tell you what to do and how to live your life. You're going to have new programs with new terms and new data and new post-it notes on the wall. <laughs> it's people trying to make sense of the world. Change will be constant. But whatever someone is offering, it's only going to work if it works for you. right? If it's a, you should be loud and obnoxious, that's going to map well onto me, but not you. Remember that you've got to find what are the techniques and tactics that work for your way of doing stuff. Get curious. By using detail about relationships, it'll keep you calm. If you stay calm, you'll calm the other person down too. People who are, like if you're dealing with constant interaction, people who are constantly jacked up, they're addicted to adrenaline. It's like free meth. And if you get jacked up with them, you're like a dealer. You want to calm it down, and then you'll get less attention from there. So you're going to focus on the detail. Right? Wow, that's like the 15th time they bit their lip. Right? Just keep thinking of the detail, because it'll keep your mind focused. Develop a work character. Right? Who am I when I go to work? 
And who am I when I get home? Try the experiment. It's cool to joke around with your friends at the office. You can tell each other who your superhero characters are and try them on for a week. It'll be hilarious. It's like, wow, I totally saw you were doing like you were Wonder Woman there. Like, that's, like, that's awesome, right? You shouldn't have lassoed that, that customer, but. <laughs> See if you can process creatively, meaning acknowledge when something sucks and do something about it. So if somebody comes in and they go up one side of you and down the other, or they say something really horrific, don't say, I'm tough. Of course you're tough. Say, that hurts, I'm going for a walk. Or that hurts, I'm going to listen to some metal. I'm going to go outside and scream. I'm going to do something. Process. They just poisoned you. Make a decision to take that poison and convert it to beauty. Yeah? The artistic way. Which means, by the way, not crappy art. I don't like all this stuff where they just say, oh, look, let's all just do finger painting. And so that's not going to do it. It needs to be something good. Okay? Mirror people. Mirror, if you get mirror, the whole thing, everything is taken care of. Learn how to mirror. Right? You'll hear people say mirror their physical gestures, mirror, mirror. No, no, no. Just be with them, hear what they're saying, and be able to repeat a bit of it back to them. When you're dealing with longer relationship stuff, I would suggest get yourself a paper notebook and say, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything, so I'm going to take some notes. That gives you something to do in case they're boring as all heck. <laughs> right? So you're focused, you're getting some of the stuff, and then when they're done, because you get some of these people, they rant for nine hours, and you're like, um, so you want what? Right? Like they're not making any sense. So you can be right there with them, repeat a little bit back, and you'll snap them out of it. And then finally, listen to Joe. At the beginning, I gave you this warning that comes from this Joe Rogan guy. One of the things that I'm really worried about in contemporary society is the amount of consultants that are out there telling you how to live your lives. How in the heck do I know how to live your life? You're doing extraordinary stuff. You're serving our city. You're serving our citizens. And that's a beautiful thing. It's an honor to be able to come here and talk to you. And I'm doing my best, and I'm trying to bring you stuff that I know works from the research, but do not trust me. Try the things out, and if they work, they're yours. And if they don't work, it's my fault. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>